Hello and welcome to another Rebel Conversation. I am Marcy Stout and with my sister, Allison Nissen, we started this journey quite a few years ago with one goal, is we wanted to interview amazing entrepreneurs and leaders, authors and coaches to learn from them and learn from their story and their expertise and have a conversation that is just uplifting and fun. And today I am personally very excited to have Hillary Tarkenton with us because she is a nutritionist in psychological wellness, which I personally love wellness. I love nutrition because I'm a great student, not authority of it. But when I started hearing these new things, I am so excited, Hillary, to have you here and learn from you. Thank you. It's good to be here. And is it Hillary Tarkington Stowers? Oh, it's a mouthful. It's Hillary Tarkington Stowers. I started wow. in business uh, before I was married. And so I just hung on to that and then uh, added my husband's name and it's Stowers <laughs> like Al. <laughs> Oh, all right. That's why I love my sister. Thank you. I appreciate you doing that. So that way we had a good representation. Um, all right. So I'd love to start with the first question, just keeping it really simple. Can you tell us what you do for work? Okay. Well, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. Um, I am a certified holistic health counselor, which I got into in 2010. Um, and there's a bit of a background as to how I entered that field. But um, just to kind of let you know about the hats I wear currently, I'm also a fitness instructor. I've been a spin instructor, indoor cycling since 2007. And I am currently an intern at uh, the Wellness Connection and grad student at George Mason University. So I am not enrolled in classes this summer. I have my final semester this fall. And um, I'm seeing my clients this summer at the practice. Basically, you can put those hours towards residency. And once I complete the schooling, then I'll become a resident full time. Well, there's nothing more than that. There's nothing more that Alice and I love more than that growth mindset. And so often as you kind of become very successful, you know, you graduate from college, you start your career. We don't often hear women with confidence talk about going back to school or internships and things like that. So I'm already inspired by you. And I would love to learn more about um, when you get out, you know, when you get all the degrees and you're ready to do your work, give us a little bit like insight to your vision of the, of the work you want to be doing and, you know, your expertise that you have. And, um, you know, I know it's coupled with some of the work you're already doing now, but we'd love to learn more. Sure. Well, to talk about the future, it's probably best to start with the past. So um, in 2001, I was unknowingly infected with Lyme disease. I lived in California. And I went on to be very ill for the next nine years. And lots of doctors just treated my symptoms and didn't ever get to the root cause of the problem. And I moved to Virginia and found these holistic MDs who essentially in 08 uh, said I needed to be gluten-free. And so I became gluten-free. And at that point, some of my symptoms started to abate, still didn't know what was wrong with me. And then I was very active and have always been very active in the fitness world and um, met someone through my gym, who was a personal trainer, a Pilates instructor, and we had a lot of common interests. And we both decided to attend a nutrition school, which at the time was brick and mortar. It's called the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. After that year, it switched to an online um, format. But we had like front row seats for Deepak Chopra and Mark Hyman and Andrew Weil and a lot of people who are kind of like the rock stars of the nutrition world. And it's a very uh, integrative, holistic approach. So that summer, that it was about a month before I graduated, uh, the doctors who I mentioned found out that I had chronic Lyme disease and reported me to the CDC. My numbers tested off the charts, and that's what ended up being wrong. So I could see, even in the years leading up to the diagnosis, how diet and nutrition mm -hmm. played a role in my health. And then I spent the next like two to three years um, in recovery as far as doing different treatments, some more traditional and others were a little bit more um, unconventional, but I did whatever it took and was able to go out and use my certification as this holistic health counselor and, and started my own practice called um, the cert, uh, Holistic Health and Nutrition. So I've been in business with that, as I mentioned, um, since that time. And I would give some pro bono talks for Lyme patients and their parents. Um, and I would also do talks on sugar and um, all sorts of different things. So that allowed me at the same time I'm do I was doing all that, I was in this world of finance, which I had started back in 1996. So I was earning my bread and butter through that, but I didn't really have a passion for it. I had a passion for health and wellness and fitness. 
And I really wanted to help other people make their journey less challenging and not have them have to recreate the wheel. So um, just went on about continuing teaching on the side, having my practice on the side, seeing individual clients on a referral basis. I'd have Lyme literate medical doctors in the area refer patients to me. Um, and then kind of around the time that the pandemic started, I was leading up to that, I was working with, with folks and just starting to realize these people, it's not just about weight or food. Um, it's a symptom, much like my what happened to me, the under, underlying cause was the Lyme. Um, it's a symptom of unhappiness. You know, people would have like a miserable marriage and they were eating recreationally or someone maybe was abused as a child and never told anyone and they were emotionally eating. And I'd have success working with them as a holistic health counselor. And some of the training I received was what they call about uh, primary food, meaning like there's food, food, secondary food, which is as you know it, but primary food is like kind of what feeds the soul and the spirit and the mind. And if that's not aligned, then the rest of it doesn't fall into place. So it was sort of a springboard for me to enter this new field because these people who I was having success with wanted to refer people to me. And I said, you know, like that's outside my scope. I'm a certified holistic health counselor. I am not a therapist. And then when the pandemic started, I just thought, why not me? And I started researching schools that were what's called KCREP accredited. Don't even ask me to tell you what the <laughs> acronym stands for. It's so long and I can't remember, but it's a very reputable designation in this field. And so I only applied to universities that had the accreditation and, you know, figured out by the end of that year, maybe early 2021, what I was going to do and um, transition to working part-time in finance to kind of dip my toe in the water and started school part-time. So um, it's about a three-year program. And then uh, the residency is, depending on how many hours per week you work, a couple of a couple of years to complete the hours. But um, I've worked for other people my entire career. I'm very happy where I'm interning at the Wellness Connection. It's considered an Aldi. Some people say Stone Ridge. Some people say South Riding, but I'm having a good experience there. I see about 14 to 16 clients a week. Um, but eventually I'll probably go out and hang my own shingle since I've already been doing my own thing in the nutritional world. And I like the notion of kind of integrating what I know about nutrition and health and wellness into the mental health, health and wellness realm. So that's kind of, I know that was a super long response to your question, but it's a bit of a complicated way as to how I got here in front of you today. I am so excited that you are here. And first of all, congratulations. I mean, that's a lot of steps. That's a lot of change. And you just embraced it. You said, why not me? Which is one of the best questions we can ever ask ourselves. Because if the start stops us, we're never going to be able to take that first step. And so congratulations. Absolutely. Uh, I want to go back to the sort of the beginning with the idea of, um, so you were diagnosed, you had undiagnosed Lyme, Lyme disease for a really long time. And I've met people and heard story, horror stories about people that have had Lyme disease. So this is a, maybe an, is it an emerging diagnosis? It's like, it was kind of ignored for such a long time. Is that really what happened? Well, there, it's a multifaceted response, Allison. So um, this is, you know, an unpopular opinion with people in the insurance world, but they would like to deny that chronic Lyme disease exists because they don't want to pay for it. And the insurance companies are publicly traded companies. Their accountability is not to a patient, but it's to a shareholder. Mm -hmm. I know this as a Lyme patient and a former person in finance. So there's that element that we have to contend with. When you are infected and it's an acute a diagnosis that typically means maybe you had a bullseye evident, you know, they catch it quickly. You're on four, six, eight weeks of doxycycline and they can eradicate it. Um, but Lyme is known as the great imitator. And so it attacks the weakest organs and systems in your body. So where it came after my thyroid, it could go after someone else's um, blood system. Like I know someone that had POTS. It, it wasn't actually POTS, which is a blood disorder. It was Lyme. I know someone else who um, has a couple of MTHFR and um, these, you know, this is kind of like getting more into the medical world, but jargon wise um, and PEMT mutations and a weaker liver. And so the Lyme attacked his liver. So when I'm working with people, it's like, you're almost like a medical detective. And one of the worst things that can happen is if you have a very 
basic uh, Lyme representation in, or actually the presentation in your body, like um, arthritis, a lot of those doctors, and I know I'm generalizing, but they are RA doctors and they wear an RA lens. So they have blinders on. So they only know to treat for RA. So then they put you on immunosuppressive drugs and then the Lyme bacteria runs rampant. So we really, this is, it's starting to be more widely known. It's starting to be more widely accepted. There are starting to be more labs because if you do a CDC, like a basic CDC test, um, you might test negative, but if you pay for a more comprehensive test, which of course is not covered by insurance, it's going to test show you're testing positive. So we have it. It was underdiagnosed. It was misdiagnosed. It was declined, denied, whatever you want to call it to be paid for. And so people were just getting sicker and sicker. There's um, a great documentary called Under Our Skin. There's a sequel to that that's out. Um, and there's more stuff that that's starting to become more mainstream that um, I do put on my website. It's just my name, Hillary with one L, HillarySowers.com. There's a whole section on Lyme resources for anyone who's interested in, in this. Yeah, that's wow. so important because I do feel like there is a mass business with insurance and healthcare. And America, we've gotten to the place where um, we're always treating symptoms, mm -hmm. and if symptoms are expensive, and you can kind of put it at bay and blame it on something else. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just what's happening, but there's another momentum. I feel like doctors are starting to get a little bit more in the preventative medicine. I feel like there's a lot more news out there on things like that. Um, all right. So let me ask you a question. You have somebody that's watching this or some, you know, somebody, a patient or client, and they're just like constantly, cause a lot of the symptoms are similar to other things. Like, so they're constantly tired, they're constantly achy, they're constantly like, they just, you know, they don't feel good. What are some of the first things that you do to help them? It was interesting. The first thing you had to drop was gluten. And I'm mm -hmm. like, it always seems to be food as our poison or our medicine. Mm -hmm. So I just love to know if like, if somebody is, you know, maybe it's Lyme, maybe it's not Lyme, but like, if they're kind of having those negative symptoms, how do you start? Like, okay. but so for, it's it's named, just so you know the backstory on it, it's named Lyme disease for Lyme, Connecticut, where the disease originated. So actually, I'll tell you, you guys are lay people, but if you go to a doctor and he or she says Lyme's disease, they have no idea what they're talking about if they add an S. That's a tell. So um, th that is a difficult answer because, first of all, I always preface everything. I'm not an MD. I'm just a patient advocate and a person who is pretty well versed in this as a lay person. And then a big part of my nutrition counseling practice encompasses Lyme. That is my niche and specialty. I also don't want to be like the doctors I described who wear those lenses because there are other things that can be going on. When people are consuming what's called SAD, the standard American yeah, diet, well. you are well. oftentimes depleted of different types of nutrients. It could be B vitamins. It could be uh, iron. If you're someone who a lot of times is, um, for whatever reason, health reasons, religious reasons, you don't consume iron, you could be iron deficient. And so malaise, depression, different things like that can pop up. So you're always trying to get to the root cause. Um, you want to have a good doctor, a person who is open-minded and willing to run different panels. If the doctors just run a basic panel, a basic blood panel, that's like looking at just the basics, you're probably going to miss some things. The main thing they'll include on that will be like a vitamin D level. And if you have low vitamin D, some of those same symptoms apply. So um, there are several Lyme labs that are rep reputable. Um, one of them is called Igenix. One of them is called Vibrant Wellness. Um, there's another one that's name is escaping me right now, but it's one of those like spelled kind of phonetically. It's on my website as well. Mm -hmm. But um, you want to be working with what's called, I mentioned the term earlier, Lyme Literate Medical Doctor, LLMDs. Mm -hmm or LAMPS, Lyme Aware Medical Practitioners, because they know what to test for. Mm. And if it's not Lyme, then you wanna have some sort of like maybe food sensitivity testing done. Um, there's one that requires a doctor's script. I used it in the past, it's called KBMO, um, not covered by insurance, does require a medical script. If you want one that is um, does not require a doctor's prescription, is more mainstream and probably a little bit more affordable, Possibly you could resubmit to your insurance to see if they pay for it. It depends on your insurance, but it's called Everly Well. 
Um, mm. I have not done that myself, but I have interpreted results for people. It's actually a pretty easy test to interpret. And depending on the severity of your symptoms and potential food intolerances, that would dictate which level test you'd want to take. If you're someone who just has a few things going on, you would probably take the most basic test. If you have more complicated stuff or excessive things popping up, dairy, gluten, shellfish, nuts, those are kind of some of the main ones. Um, you probably want to take the more comprehensive one. Those are good starting points. Um, and then there's a whole area of the gut micro microbiome where if you have any issues going on in that realm, that can affect your absorption the same way, or I shouldn't say the same way, but similarly to how having a gluten intolerance can affect your nutritional absorption. So just in a very basic uh, visual way, um, the intestines are lined with villi and villi that are healthy operate like this. Mm -hmm. If you have celiac disease, which is just that, a disease and an allergy, then oh, I just put my little hand up on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, your villi are flat. That means that all the food that you're eating just flows through your intestines, but it doesn't get absorbed into your hair, your nails, your skin. And so you're, you're nutrient deficient. And then um, if you are looking at this kind of spectrum of celiac being an allergy and more and more people developing gluten intolerance, which is one of the primary causes is having genetically modified crops introduced, which started mm -hmm. with a company called Monsanto, which has now been bought by Bayer, and they were using glyphosate, also known as Roundup, to kill the bugs that are eating the crops. Well, it's a known cancer-causing agent. So if you're eating these crops, including wheat, and then sometimes there's cross-contamination with oats that are nearby, grown nearby, then the body is just like, I can't handle this. So the villi function as far as your gluten intolerance is going to vary. So if you have severe gluten intolerance, you're down here closer to celiac. If you have, you know, higher functioning, you're here and the villi is grabbing something. So what we're having in society now is um, the medical term is, is intestinal permeability, but the layperson term is leaky gut. And that's leading to an array of autoimmune diseases. So it's, it's a real problem. And this goes back to food lobbyists, drug lobbyists, and paying off people in positions of decision-making authority, whether it be politicians or the FDA or the USDA, essentially for the equivalent of real estate on grocery store shelves. So it's, it's, a, um, it's a real issue. And until and unless we forbid that from happening, they have influence on um, what is eaten. You could have a high school diploma, you could be an MD, but if you see it on the grocery store shelf, you believe it's safe. And there's actually a term mm -hmm. that the government uses called grass, generally recognized as safe. So they will take some of these things that have known carcinogens in them and they will say they are grass. And if you even look at, you know, outside the food realm, but just again, going back to people in positions of decision-making authority, there was one man at uh, the FDA who approved the Sacklers Purdue Pharma opioids. One guy, he was the linchpin. And then he went on to go work for the Sacklers. So it's, there's just so much corruption um, in, in, you know, government and in the USDA and the FDA. So when I see things um, that are at the grocery store, I'm just like, that doesn't mean much to me. I shop at the farmer's market every weekend and I shop at a health food store. Yeah, it really is crazy. I know like the wine industry, what they would never allow in Italy from vineyards because mm -hmm. the stuff that gets put in their wine is really just great, you know, and the California wines are so many that you don't even ask what year it is anymore because they all taste the same, whether there was fires or not, it still tastes the same because there's so much sugar and pesticides and everything that gets put into it. And I, I think the uh, skincare is the same. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's a uh, lotion products and sunscreen that we allow on the shelf here for all of our children, but in Europe they're banned. And, you know, we'd love to know your thoughts about, you know, anything that we can do to kind of make sure we stop getting fooled by what we believe to be safe and, you know, live kind of, you know, get closer to the healthier side. You are, everything you said is hundred percent correct. Um, so let's say you're one of those folks that's on the gluten intolerant spectrum and you go to Italy um, and you eat their pasta or you eat their pizza. You might not have any reaction like you would have here. You may not. Again, it varies on the person. You could have a more severe 
um, intolerance closer to an allergy, which by the way, quick side note, there's no drug company looking for a cure to celiac because the only cure is to eat gluten-free. So there's no money to be made in it. I just always follow the money. So what I'll say in response to your question is I'm going to quote Michael Pollan, who's a famous author and, you know, healthy food advocate, a uh, very prolific speaker, author, um, he's written several books, uh, Food Rules, and, and a bunch of different books you can look at there. He's also listed under the movers and shakers section of my website as a person to follow. Vote with your wallet. If there is no market for these foods, then they will not stock them. So um, sometimes people complain, and I understand, uh, about the cost of paying for things that are a little bit more expensive to buy food-wise. However, <laughs> I would argue the cost of paying on the back end for your health Healthcare. or prescriptions for copays for surgery for whatever disease you get i can't remember the exact cost of of what um the expenses to you as a person who gets diabetes because it varies at what point in your life that you get it but how many more hundreds of thousands of dollars you spend on healthcare than a person who doesn't have it it's the numbers add up so you know, voting with your wallet is key. Buying organic is key. Right now, even though it is the USDA that oversees that, we don't really have a better alternative. Um, so buying from your local farmer's market, as I mentioned, I do. Um, there are CSAs, Community Supported Agriculture. So if you live near a farm, you can buy a half a share or a share, and they just essentially deliver you every week what is in season. So that's eating seasonally, eating locally, supporting your local farmer. You can directly speak to him or her and say, what are your practices? Um, there are other companies I like to buy from online. There's a woman, um, her name is Carl Lynn Call, and she's out of Utah. And she has a great company called Just ingredients and she makes everything in the US and it's all very transparent, no dyes, you know, no parabens. She does a lot of um, things like protein powder, but she'll do lip balm and skincare. So kind of just paying attention to people who move in those worlds and are trying to do better by our children and by, you know, ourselves. I mean, when I see at the other end of the spectrum, elderly people, I was a patient advocate for my grandparents who lived to be over a hundred years old and the types of things that the registered dietitians, um, where their curriculum is is dictated by uh, the USDA, FDA body and bodies, um, they did not want people like me in a hospital setting, <laughs> because <laughs> it's kind of like a rooster in the hen house or a fox in the hen house. You know, they were giving elderly people who are the most sick and vulnerable among us a uh, diet iced tea, margarine, and Ensure. Ensure has carrageenan in it, which is a red seaweed, which people might think at face value, seaweed sounds good. It's highly inflammatory to the gut in a healthy person. If you are sick and elderly, if you have IBS, if you have Crohn's, if you have celiac, any type of GI issue, having carrageenan, which is used as, as an emulsifier in dairy products and non-dairy products as a thickening agent, wreaks havoc on your innards. <laughs> Just wreaks havoc. Wow. Well, um, Hillary, you have given us so much information. I am uh, like, my brain is just spinning. I know um, in our own family, we have gluten and dairy intolerance, and it's it's really challenging. And so you are getting this certificate, and you're hopeful that you will be able to hang up your own shingle. What's that going to look like? Well, I have been, you know, actively seeing nutrition clients that can also be interchangeably called patients, especially if they come to me from a doctor referral to help them with whatever their diagnosis has been, essentially learn, relearn how to grocery shop, cook and eat for their conditions. Lyme is my specialty, but I do work with other conditions. And I do have some clients who have more, um, we'll call them run of the mill challenges. Um, so with obtaining a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling, and then in the state of Virginia, when you pass your exam and complete your residency, you're called an LPC, a licensed professional counselor. I focus now, so I wear two very different hats as far as like my own private practice and what I do here versus what I do at the agency where I have, you know, a different type of insurance and I practice inside the scope of mental health. I'm able to kind of like pepper in some of my expertise on the nutrition world. For example, um, if there's a client that 
is experiencing some of the things you mentioned earlier, like malaise, depression, whatever, right away, you know, I might speak to them or if it's a minor child to the parent and ask them, like, when was the last time they went to the doctor? What does their blood panel look like? You know, are they low in vitamin D? Are they low in iron? Like what's causing this? Is there something mm -hmm. beyond what I can do in talk therapy that is happening that needs to be addressed? Because we need to look at, again, the, the DBA of my company, holistic health and nutrition. We need to look at things holistically. So I intend to continue serving the clients um, that I see at the mental health counseling practice and doing my best to support them. And unlike some of my counterparts who went to grad school right out of undergrad, I have 24 years of experience, like business experience, 14 years of experience in running my own business and obviously my own personal health challenges and serving as a patient advocate for myself and family members. So I think that it's a really good complement in working with people um, in the mental health arena. I just think that that integration of, you know, the body and the mind and, and the gut, <laughs> it all just kind of flows really nicely together and hits all the marks for me. My goodness. Well, Hillary Tarkington's dope stowers. You got stowers. It. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know I, I mess up names like, uh, nobody's business. I'm, I'm probably like the world champion of messing up names. Uh, <laughs> we are, this has been really a great conversation. And so you said your website is Hillary stowers.com. Yep. It's Hillary with one L Hillary stowers.com. And there are a bunch of resources on there, um, from a nutritional standpoint. And then, uh, the company where I'm doing my internship and we have a lot of great practitioners, whether they're senior clinicians or residents or interns, it's called the wellness connection. Um, there's a profile for me on that website. And I also am on psychology today. I'm going to be soon wrapping up my training as a grief educator. So I'm going to be mm. a, a certified grief educator. And I am also trained in something called EMDR it's eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And it's something that was designed in the 1980s by a woman who's no longer with us, but her name was, uh, is Dr. Francine Shapiro. And it was used to treat trauma. And she started out on military veterans. And basically what we do is through bilateral stimulation. So it could be like visual, like fingers like this. Um, it could be what we call butterfly tapping like this. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes if you do telehealth, you have a light scope. Those things can be rather expensive. Um, and I have vibrating tappers that alternate that I can have a client hold in, in their hand. So it depends on what they respond best to. The butterfly tapping is good to teach them to do on their own. But essentially, if they have something traumatic that's occurred, um, I'll give you a couple examples. Let's say it's a single incident, like you were in a car accident. There's like an 80 to 85% up to 100% efficacy of reprocessing this maladaptive memory in a more adaptive way in one session. So if it's acute like that, it can help. If you have something like that's more layered and nuanced um, or that was more ongoing, like uh, something really unfortunate, like you were sexually abused or physically abused or something like that, that is going to take a bit more time to unpack. But what we're trying to do is use this, um, it's, it's based in neuroscience approach to help the client reprocess a maladaptively stored memory in a more adaptive way and give them resources to deal with that. And also if they were to encounter something in the future that might be considered, uh, people use the word triggering, but like activating, that they're better adept and equipped to handle it had then had they not had the EMDR. So I'm a very firm believer in that. And I paid for that training outside of my, um, my graduate work as I did with this um, grief work that I'm doing. And every single human being is going to, if they haven't already go through loss, whether it's you know, the natural course of life or pet loss um, or something more complicated or ambiguous or anticipatory like Alzheimer's um, or divorce is the death of a marriage. Sometimes when people lose their jobs or even retire, their identity is very heavily tied up in that. So I'm trying to get the certification through David Kessler. It's K-E-S-S-L-E-R and his website is just grief.com. He's considered this, the country, if not the world's most leading expert in this. He trained under Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who's a psychiatrist, and she designed 
the five stages of grief. It's like denial, bargaining, sadness, anger, all this stuff. Posthumously, he got permission from her family to add a sixth stage, which is finding meaning. And he lost his own mother at a, as a young boy. I think he was 13 and he lost, lost his adult son. And um, he really truly embodies like finding meaning in his loss and his training. I think there are 400 of us all over the world in this. And then he also holds these tender heart groups, support groups for people who have different types of loss. It could be death by suicide. It could be loss of an adult child. It could be miscarriage. It could be loss of a partner. And then they'll have subgroups because the 80 year old who lost their life partner's needs, support needs and grief is very different than a 40 year old widow who has small children. So this is something I feel really passionately about. And is it just another tool in my toolkit? You know, the nutrition, the grief, you know, training, the EMDR and all the different ther uh, theoretical approaches and modalities um, that you learn as a clinical mental health counseling student. So I'm just really trying to put it all together and do my best in this helping profession to, to serve others. Uh, well, Hillary, one thing I absolutely love about you is they always say, if your career is where your passions are, it'll never feel like work. And it's so evident with every sentence you say, how passionate you are about this. So we are so honored to be here with you today. And thank you for sharing your insights and you know teaching us a lot of things that are really smart for us to know. So um, appreciate your time and uh, best of luck with everything. And to those of you who joined us, I hope you loved our conversation with Hillary and you can follow her at her website, HillarySpowers.com. Thank, you, Thank so you so much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Rebel Coach is a collaborative platform that builds leadership programs for entrepreneurs, coaches, executives, and authors. For more information, visit us at revelcoach.com and follow us on LinkedIn to never miss an update.